We've been doing a lot of sermons in Romans 12. There's so much in practicality. And sometimes we get bogged down in doctrine. I guess it's all doctrine, but there's a lot of heavy doctrine. We went through the first eight chapters, understanding how to divide out and understand God's plan for Israel, past, present, and future in Romans 9, 10, and 11. But Romans 12, now it gets into how are you going to live as a Christian? And the Bible says, He maketh the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth the rain on the just and the unjust. And if we see ourselves as only the good and the just farmer, and we shake our fist at God because He allowed sun and rain for the evil and the unjust guy to grow his crops, God wants us to take a look at our lives and say, we're just out of line. Um, we really, when we can't love and serve others, we really are just, we're shaking our fist and cursing at, our, at the God that we say that we love. And Romans 12 isn't heavy doctrine. Romans 12 is heavy living. <laughs> How to live right. And we misrepresent our Lord. This is going to be some tough stuff this Sunday and next Sunday. But how we deal with evil, if we don't deal with it biblically and properly, we are not representing our Lord the way that He would have us represent Him. So let's start reading. Matter of fact, um, when we're in Romans 12, uh, look at the 14th verse. We already preached on it. I'm just going to mention it. Um, it says... Uh, uh, verse 14 says, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. It, God's forbidding. He forbids. If you're feeling devoted to blessing someone, don't. Okay? If you're even thinking it or feeling it, God says don't do it. And then He says in verse number 17, He says, um, Recompense to no man evil for evil. So in verse 14, he says, I don't even want you to think about it or have any feelings on it. Verse 17, he says, I don't even, you're, not even, you're not allowed to act on it. I don't want you thinking it. I don't want you acting on it. I don't want you to be devoted and acting upon that devotion to recompense. That means to compensate. To repay, to return an equivalent. Evil, I'm going to return an equivalence of evil. And God tells us in His Word, that is not right. And Lord, I've been doing right and they've been doing wrong. Why don't you let them have it? Matter of fact, Lord, why don't you just let me let them have it? I'm on your side, God. I'm ready to... God says, hold on. Recompense, okay, no, to no man evil for evil. Um, what is God's will for us to do in a situation like that? Charity never faileth. That's God's will for our life is to show some charity. Go to 1 Peter 2 and let's kind of open up this text a little bit or this thought. 1 Peter chapter 2, keep your finger in Romans 12. 1 Peter 2. Watch what we're asked to lay aside. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Can you do that? When you're ready to return evil for evil and repay the equivalence of the evil that you've seen done to you, are you ready to lay aside your evil speaking? But Lord, He spoke evil to me. He said bad things to me. Okay, well, I'm telling you, the Lord, the Lord is telling us, He says, okay, you need to put aside all evil speakings. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be, have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Have you tasted His grace? You've got the sincere milk of the Word. We've got we to lay aside some things. Man, our sign says, Pilgrim Baptist Church. I'd like to think that we're all pilgrims. Verse number 11, watch what it says. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts 
That would be, someone did me evil, I'm going to do it back. If you're a pilgrim, abstain from that. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. I don't know if I can do that. Okay, we'll go to verse 21. We have an example that is absolutely 100% perfect. Verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us. Did they do Him evil? Did He suffer for us? Doing what? Leaving us an example, not that we have to die on the cross, but that we should follow His steps. How do we do that? Well, it says concerning Christ, who did no sin, neither was guile found in His mouth, who when He was reviled, reviled not again. When He suffered, He threatened not, but committed Himself to Him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live, recompensing evil to evil? No, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. God calls us, God commands us to live righteously. <laughs> he committed his life unto the Father. We are to do the same. We are not to speak evil. Someone curses you out. Don't curse them back. But you want to. I know, so do I. <laughs> and that's wrong. We are living as righteous pilgrims and we have an example as Jesus Christ. No guile in our mouths. And I know you and I are trapped in a body of flesh. But look, we need to do our best to yield to God so that we don't sin. Man, everybody... Galatians 2.20, Christ liveth in me. We know it. We quote it. Man, if we love God, we keep His commandments. Man, we love it. We quote it. Well, are we going to keep this commandment? Recompense no man evil for evil. Aren't we good at picking out the commandments that others don't do that we're okay with keeping? <laughs> yeah. Man, we got all these lists of commandments. These are the ones I'm good at, Lord. And we can find the ones that we're good at. We can find others aren't doing them. But that recompense to no man evil for evil, I'm going to guess that that's probably all of us at some time in our life. If not this past week, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming because someone's going to do you wrong. Someone's going to do you evil. All right, go to Proverbs 20. Proverbs 20. Evil for evil. I'll tell you, you, you return evil for evil, you can bet that if another Christian sees you do that, they're going to say, this is why the body of Christ has a bad reputation. Because they see another Christian not acting like a Christian. And when the world, I'm not talking about a saved person, when, a world, when the world hears that you and I are Christians, yet you and I are not following this command, they pick it out. They know the Bible. They're not wanting to follow it, but they know that you should be following it. And it gives them a bad taste in their mouth about Christianity when we don't obey recompense to no man evil for evil. And Pro Amen. Proverbs 20, look at verse number 22. Proverbs 20, uh, verse number 22. Say not thou, I will recompense evil. Never even say it. But wait on the Lord. That's what we need to study. A lot of our Bible study should probably be, Lord, how do we wait on you? <laughs> well, I want to wait on you, Lord, to let those guys have it. I want to wait on you, Lord, to seek um, revenge for me, Lord. Oh, no. Here's what the Lord wants us to study on how to wait. The Lord wants us to wait on Him. Not so that the other guy that did us evil can get it stuck to him. He wants us to wait on Him so He can teach us how to bear the wrong. We live in a world of marshmallow Christians and they can't bear wrong. You and I are going to be done wrong. Wait on the Lord 
and have ask him to help you bear it. We talk back to the Lord. Well, I'm going to even the score. We're just talking back to him. He told us one thing and we got a better idea. Well, I'm not going to say it. I'm just going to have an attitude about it. I'm not going to say it. I'm just going to behave a certain way. I'm not going to behave or act a certain way. But I'll tell you what, my feelings are certainly going to be, I'm going to hide them, but I'm going to have my feelings about it. And Lord, all we're doing is talking back to the Lord. That's all we're doing. And you might, and I might hide it with our words or hide it with our behavior. But He knows our feelings and our thoughts. We should honor Him and wait on Him. Go back to 1 Peter. I should have asked you to keep your finger there, but let's look at verse chapter 3. First Peter chapter number 3. This is a great next passage, I think, for our, thought, for our thoughts. Watch what the Bible says in 1 Peter 3. Verse number 9, Rent, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrawise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. Well, what's the blessing? Really, the big scope blessing is that we are obeying God's will. He has to tell us to not render evil for evil because our will is to do quite the opposite. So the blessing that we get inherited from not doing that is, well, I, I, I got to obey God's will and I'm so much better off for it. You're not going to have that guilt built up in you that you've done wrong. The victor is the one that can do this, by the way. Uh, 1 Peter 3, next verse. I lost. Okay. Uh, verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Young people, this is for you, even though it's for all of us. I need to talk to you. Well, my brother owes me an apology or I'm going to let him have it. Well, my sister, I can't believe it. God says, you're wrong. You're wrong. Refrain your tongue. And young people, when your parents tell you you need to do X, Y, and Z and you, and you talk back to them, Refrain your, that's evil. Refrain your tongue from evil. <laughs> a couple of, I mean, I'll fish, I'll wait here and I'll fish a little bit for an amen. I mean, that, look, that, that's good teaching right there, young people. <laughs> you get a hold of that. Well, I, I don't know what to do with it. Just be nice to your brother and be nice to your sister. Parents don't want to be worn out all day listening to you two yap and, and fuss and fight. and Just be nice. Stop rendering evil for evil. Stop thinking you're the victim that something so bad has happened to you. You're blessed! You have parents that love you. They bring you to church. They feed you. They clothe you. Watch your tongue. How dare they talk to me like that? Like you're so spiritual. You know, if we just thought we... You know why we get offended? You know why we get offended? Because we just think we're so high. Look, if you think you're a nobody, nothing will offend you. <laughs> are you saying my kids are nobodies? In this particular context, yes. They should just get as low as they can get. You are special in God's eyes. You are special in your parents' eyes. You are special in your church family's eyes. But in God's eyes, He also tells you that you need to not render evil for evil and you need to make sure you keep your tongue and your lips from speaking evil. Why? For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and His ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Is God against me? When you do evil, He's against you. Young people, 
You can label somebody else as unchristian. Man, you, kids that grow up in church, they can sniff it out. Homeschool kids that are getting, they're, every minute of the day, every hour of the day, they're getting good teaching from their parents. They're in church every time the doors are open. Man, they can spot it in lost people. They can. Man, I just spotted something unchristian in that person. As you are acting and responding in an unchristian way. It's complete hypocrisy. And all of us need to be aware of it. All of us. We can't get so high in our... I wrote down this note. Uh, you all know John Calvin, right? Yeah, started Calvinism, all that. All that. Well, he's a Roman Catholic priest. He got... He saw salvation by grace, not of works. And so he left the Roman Catholic Church. Well, in 1954, or no, in, 15, in, in 1541, in the mid-1500s, <laughs> John Calvin established a Christian republic in Geneva, Switzerland. He successfully established a Christian republic. That meant... He, was a, he wanted to get away from a church state, and so he created his own. But he wanted, to, he wanted to legislate righteousness. So what Calvin did was, he shut down all of the taverns in Geneva. All the drinking taverns were shut down. And one of the, one of the tavern owners, Pierre Amour, I think his name was, he was so upset about this. He was highly offended so him and a few of his buddies, they were drinking one night and it got word out that Pierre Armour was talking bad about John Calvin and what he did was shutting down his saloon. So you know what Calvin did? The guy disagreed with Calvin, so he had him arrested <laughs> for talking bad about him. He got him arrested. And when it goes before the council, the council said... We will let you out of jail if you give a, an apology to John Calvin. And you know what Calvin said? That is not a severe enough punishment. And he said, I want Pierre Armour to walk through the streets of Geneva giving a public apology to me, John Calvin. And you know what happened? John Calvin got it. <laughs> And Pierre Armour, he, had to, he walked through the street. I am sorry that I talk bad about John Calvin. You know what that is? That is a man taking vengeance where God said, you don't have to repay somebody the evil that they gave to you. That's God's business. Look, I'd much rather have no alcohol places in town. But if the men of this church gather up and we try to shut them all down, you really think legislating righteousness is going to do anything for somebody's heart? It isn't. What does that mean for us, parents and grandparents, and even adult Christians living our own lives? Yeah, we can't make our children's heart right. You can have the right rules. You can have the right environment. You can get rid of all the wrong music and all the wrong movies, all that. They didn't have none of that in the garden. And guess what happened? A murderer arised. You cannot legislate matters of the heart. That's God's business. And let us not forget it. All right, go back to Romans 12. I got another one for you, for the, for you youngins. But go to Romans 12 because we got to get back on course or... I'll never have us out in time for the Golden Corral. <laughs> I'm, kid I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Romans 12, look at verse number 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Look, brother, sis, if you, brothers and sisters, can you prefer the other? Can you prefer? Can you prefer? The other person. Remember verse 12? We says, it says, patient in tribulation. Can you do that? Look at verse number 14. It says, 
Curse not. We already read that one. Verse number 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. That's where we are, right? Okay, all right. This brother and sister are having this fight. So, mom stops the thing and she brings brother and she brings sister over to her and, you know, she, she, she teaches them joy. You know, you know what it is. You've taught this, parents. Jesus first, others second, yourself last, right? This mom even had a song and she had her kids sing it, okay? And the kids stopped fighting. Well, praise God, it must have worked. Well, they go back and a few minutes later, they're fussing and fighting again. So mom says, you know what? I'm going to have to bring these kids back. So she brings brother, she brings sister back. And she goes, okay, we're going to go through joy again, and we're going to sing the song, we're going to sing joy again. And at that point, the younger sister, she chimes in, and she says, Mom, that's fine, we can do that, but this time, can I be Jesus? <laughs> it, you know why? Because we want to be first. This is why it's hard for us to prefer the other person, because we prefer ourselves. This is why it's easy for us to render evil for evil. Why? Because we prefer ourselves being Defended. Let's be careful. Christians are way, 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 way too sensitive. Moms, if every time your little one got a little bump, got a little scratch, got a little cut, if every time that happened, you ran to the emergency room, you would go broke in six months. You'd be broke. You know what's happening to Christians? Every little fault, every little offense, every little rub the wrong way, we are going to go spiritually broke wearing ourselves out over each of those. All right? Recompense to no man evil for evil. Does 1 Timothy 2 tell us that prayers should be made for all men? I can't believe they did me wrong! How come we don't pray for all men like we're told how come we don't start with you know what I need to stop and pray <sighs> we should Proverbs 31 talks about in her tongue is the law of kindness how come that law doesn't come out it should it should stop requiring evil to be for you to be the repayer. You might break a man's spirit that way, but kindness will break their heart. And these are heart matters. Go to Colossians 3. Keep your finger in Romans 11, or 12 rather. Colossians 3. Verse number 12, Colossians 3, 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Are you saved? That's, that's you. Holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness. Can you put kindness on rather than having to render evil for evil? Humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. In the Greek, that means to suffer real long. Lord, I don't like this. Well, how about some long suffering? Well, I'm ready to recompense. I'm ready to repay equally. No. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. What rules your heart? The spirit of revenge or peace? Lastly, in Romans 12,
I'd like to look at a few more things. Romans chapter 12, verse number 17. The Bible says, Provide things honest in the sight of all men. You are justified before God by what, church family? Faith. Justified before God. But before man, you are justified by your works. This is why the Bible says to provide things honest in the sight of all men. Because justification before man depends upon our honest work in their sight. You say, yeah, I'm justified before God though. Yeah, you're right, and that's not going to change. You're saved, sealed, sanctified, all of that. But man doesn't know that. And if you don't provide things honest in their sight, they're not going to believe you when you say you're justified by faith because you've trusted Christ. And you may very well be, but they're not buying it. So God says, provide things. Pro, it means ahead or before. Vide or video, vision to see. It means provide, to see ahead. In other words, you have ahead of time, you have properly meditated upon and you have thought through, you've settled in your heart that you are going to do right. You're not going to wait for it to happen and try to fish through your mind and make a decision. No, you've already decided ahead of time, I'm going to do right. That's how God would have us to live. It's all about the sight of man. That's why the Bible says, abstain from all evil or all appearance, the, right, the appearance. And so you say, well, Lord, you go before the Lord. Lord, this isn't wrong. This isn't evil. And the Lord may say to you, you're right, fine. It's not wrong and it's not evil. But I'm not the only one that's looking. Other people are looking. Other men are looking. Other women are looking. And in their sight, because they don't have the sight of God, they don't know your heart, all they see is what they can visually see. They're not God. So yeah, you are justified before God. But before man, the appearance before them, it might appear to be evil. It's not always what you dish out, it's how people receive it. It's not always what you do, it's, how, it's what people think about what you do. You know what they say about <laughs> you're walking through a watermelon field, right? Well, they tell you, if you're walking through a watermelon field, never stoop down to tie your shoes. <laughs> why? Well, because somebody might think you're a watermelon thief, that's why. <laughs> What's that called? That's... A humorous example to draw out this truth to avoid. If it appears evil, avoid doing it. Look, your heart's pure. You're honest. Before God, God knows you're not going to be a watermelon thief. But the owner of that field doesn't. So before man, do all you can do to provide things honest in the sight of all men. This way no one can bring even the thought of an accusation against you. Purpose it in your heart and settle it beforehand so you're not in the midst of it trying to make a decision based on feelings. God's commands don't care about your feelings or my feelings, right? All right. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8 gives us some really good insight. Let's go there. 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse number 21. We get the same idea. 1 Corinthians 8, 21. Providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord. See, it's the same idea. But also in the sight of men. We're saved. We live down on her, here on earth. Yeah, we and, us and the Lord, we're great. He's reconciled us to Himself. But he also wants us to be concerned about our fellow man. We're commanded, Romans 12, present our bodies, live in sacrifice, be instant in prayer, and then provide things honest. Do you think on honest things? Philippians 4. 
Do you have honest conversations? 1 Peter 2. Do you appoint honest men over church business? Do we do that? We, yeah, we do. <laughs> Why? Acts 6. Do we lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty? 1 Timothy 2. Yeah. Every aspect and sphere of our life is about providing things honestly. I'll give a couple of practical examples as we wind down. If a man, if a father, if a husband is too busy doing ministry and providing for the things of the church and, and other things, and he's not properly provided for his wife and his children to have food and clothing and time, you know what he's not doing? Providing things honest. <laughs> and Men, if you're not in ministry, you all are. If you're a Christian, you have some work of the ministry you're doing. So you are in ministry, men. You can apply this to any aspect of your life. If you're not providing for your family, yet you're providing for others in the sight of man, that's dishonest. In the sight of God, it's dishonest too. Ladies, if you're not keeping your own home, if it's... If it's a mess and nothing's getting done and you don't care and you don't have time. God says that's dishonest. He told, he told you to keep your house. Be a keeper of your house. And so when you don't do that, you're not providing things honestly as the Lord has asked you to do. You're giving a false impression. Be a keeper of your home. And ladies, your husband needs attention and your children need attention. Fathers, your wives need attention and your children need attention. And when we don't provide that, we are out of balance. And in the sight of man, that is dishonest. Well, not everybody sees it. The ones that do see it know it's dishonest. And God knows it's dishonest. Live as a Christian. These are tough things. Bibles, you don't have to turn there for the sake of time. We'll get back to Romans 12 if you would. But Proverbs 3 says, Show thou shalt find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. It's both. It's both. Romans 12, verse 18. Last thought on the dishonesty. I'll just mention this regarding money. If Someone borrows money and they have absolutely no intention of paying it back. That's absolutely dishonest. If you're going to borrow something, you need to have an honest motive that says, I am going to make an attempt. I will attempt to pay this back. I will pay it back. Your motive needs to be honest. Uh, don't represent deception by any means. All right, let's finish up at Romans 12 and verse 18. It'll be the last verse. Romans 12, verse number 18. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's read the verse and somebody correct me if you feel led by the Lord to do so. Verse number 18, Romans 12, verse number 18. You ready? Get your eyes on the text. Live peaceably with all men. This, my wife loves this verse. When we don't get along, she says it's not possible. <laughs> you're, you're being impossible. Look, if you read the verse right, it, it says, Romans 12, 18, if it be possible. Why? Because sometimes it's not possible. You're unreasonable. You're, we've all done this. It says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, Give it your best effort to try to make it work. Live peaceably with all men. Bite your tongue. Eat your words. All that. That's what that verse means. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, 
exhaust every means possible to bring about reconciliation. You know why this verse is so important? Because we exhaust every means possible to get even. Ladies, when you get offended by your husband, or husbands, when you get offended by your wives, if you've been married long enough, you have figured out plans to get back at them. And it ain't right. It's not right. Children, you've been raised long enough by your parents. You've figured out their weaknesses. You've figured out how to conspire against them. You know how they're going to respond. And when you play that against them, that's just evil. That is wrong. As much as lieth possible. Two camps. Non-resistance says peace at any price. That's not right. Resistance means it's those that are always stirring up strife. Both of those ditches are wrong. We should love peace, but we need to be careful as well. In loving peace, that means we don't contribute to the stress and turmoil of others. We seek, we seek to live peaceably. The other person doesn't have peace, do you? They need to see it in you. The other person doesn't have the blessings that you have. But you've got them. They need to see them in you. The other person isn't following good. They're following evil. But you're a Christian. You should be following good. They need to see it in you. Exhaust every means possible to try to work it out.